Hello, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, it, it is a real pleasure to share our experiences in the UK. Um, and it, it has been quite a journey um, so far. Uh, we're not at the end of it just yet, but uh, uh, we, we hope that we have made some progress and it will be good to uh, share that with you today. Hopefully uh, my presentation is now visible to you all. Excellent, yes. Um, so my name is Gillian Unsworth and I work for the Government Equalities Office in uh, the UK, which is a central part of the UK government. And uh, we uh, report very closely to the Prime Minister and in fact the new Prime Minister, uh, Liz Truss, uh, is a, a former Minister for Women and Equality. So I can assure you that uh, gender equality and pay transparency will remain high on the agenda in the UK government's uh, policies going forward. So in the UK, uh, we have uh, already, uh, we've got an important um, difference that it, 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 I thought it was important to uh, highlight before we start off because we have a, a legislative framework that differentiates between equal pay and through the gender pay gap. So equal pay uh, refers to individuals paying a man and a woman the same and since if for the past more than 50 years it has been unlawful to pay men and women differently for work of the same or similar value. And there's an infrastructure around employment tribunals and different recourses for action if you feel that you have been paid unequally because you are a man or because you're a woman. Separate to that, uh, and more recent, has been the identification of the gender pay gap. So the gender pay gap refers to the difference in the average pay between men and women. So it could be a national gender pay gap, and we've been measuring the national gender pay gap in the UK since the 1990s, or it can be a pay gap in a, an industry. So for instance, in the construction industry, or it can be in individual companies. And it's in the individual companies that we have been taking action specifically in more recent years to try and uh, rebalance the pay between men and women. So first we set out to define the problem and we commissioned Professor Wendy Olson at Manchester University, who has created this really fascinating analysis of why it is that there is a difference between the average pay of men and women. And some of it, I think we could guess. So straight away, occupational segregation. Men and women do different types of jobs. Women are more likely to be in secretarial, more junior roles. Men are more likely to be in the senior leadership and management roles. There's also industrial segregation as well. So even if women are in uh, more senior roles, they're often in the less well-paid uh, industries. So in the UK, a third of the female workforce is, uh, sorry, two thirds of the female workforce works in health, education and retail. All three are quite low paid sectors. And so women are, are going to be in more junior roles in lower paid sectors. Then a quarter of the causes of the, the gender pay gap can be attributed to unobserved factors. And um, these cannot be explained. It's more that they can't be quantified. They include things like discrimination. So straightforward misogyny, sexism, saying you can't do that because you're a woman. But also there's an element of cultural norms that lead to decision making that is not entirely unconstrained. So for instance, it's the norm that in an opposite sex couple, the woman is more likely to take time out to look after children, more likely to take time out of her career to look after, to do, to do caring responsibilities, more likely to work part time. And all of that is down to choice, but sometimes that choice is led by cultural norms that uh, make it easier to go with the, the normal choice than to be different. But by far the greatest influence on the gender pay gap, as it states here, 40% of the gender pay gap can be attributed to labour market history. 
And that relates to women taking more likely to, to work part time, more likely to take time out of the workforce. And so that compounds over their careers to create a greater and greater difference in be the difference between what men and women are paid. And that is nicely illustrated in this next graph, which I find to be a very sad graph, uh, but so true. Again, there won't be many surprises, but it, it really does bring home what those differences between men and women's careers actually translates into in women's earnings. So this sets out how the gender pay gap opens up over the course of a woman's life. And sadly, it, it starts in late teens, early 20s. So before constraints such as childcare and, and, and elder care come along, women are already starting to manage their expectations. And we think that a lot of that is around those cultural norms that say that women will have a family so you manage your expectations around what you're going to do and that men will go on to be the breadwinners but then that plays out because uh, you can see an, a peak there in early 30s when women start to uh, take time out of the jobs market first of all for very practical reasons um, to, to actually uh, give birth in many uh, cases but also then that leads to taking time out for maternity leave and that can then often lead into professional downgrading and women only coming back part time, um, which then is piled upon as women go throughout their career and compounded as they reach their late 40s uh, when that cumulative effect of, of, of uh, fewer, uh, fewer hours in the workplace contributes to lower earnings, fewer opportunities, fewer chances to get those uh, bonuses, the better paid jobs and generally are going to be earning less than men as they reach middle age. And that's when children start to become more self-sustaining. Uh, However, women then often take on the majority of caring responsibilities for elderly parents. So as parents get older, they need ex extra care because women have already got that reduced income, are more likely to be working part time. It's a logical decision that they're more likely to start taking on that elder care as well. And then that's further compounded. So when women reach pension age, it means that they have a much smaller pension pot to, to fall back on in their old age. And particularly women who are left on their own if, if they're through either bereavement or divorce uh, can often find themselves in very difficult circumstances because of the cumulative impact of the gender pay gap. So it was these driving factors that uh, brought about uh, the uh, government back in 2017 to introduce legislation to start to really galvanise action to tackle that. So in 2017, we introduced legislation, uh, gender pay gap reporting legislation, and that requires law, large employers, so organisations with 250 or more employees, to publish specific data every year. And they have to publish it on their own website, as well as the UK government website. And the publishing on the UK government website has been crucial to the success of these plans. So the information that they have to uh, produce uh, is their overall gender pay gap, the mean and median gender bonus gap, um, and the mean and median elements on, on both of those uh, 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 bits of data are really important because they show different things for different companies. They also have to show the proportion of men and women who receive bonuses, as well as the proportion of men and women working at different pay quartiles. And those different pay quartiles are re a really good visual display of where women and men are split across the company. So what they do is they divide the all of the employees in a company into four different categories, the top earners at the top, 
the lower owners at the bottom and put the proportion of men and women in each of those categories. And so often you will notice that there's more women in those lower quartiles and more men as they increase up through the better paid quartiles at the top. And that's a real visual display of how a company may employ a lot of women, but there's something preventing them from getting to the top of the, that uh, the tree. And so we encourage employers to look at that data. So reporting is, is, is not the only uh, output from this. We don't just want them to produce some data. We want them to look at the data and work out what it is that's preventing women from progressing in their company. And so we encourage them to make an action plan, to set out what the challenges are in their company and what they're going to do about it. And one of the crucial elements, as I mentioned, is that all of this is published. So anyone, you, and there's, there's a link at the end of this, the, the slide pack that you can access, you, anyone around the world can look at live data, literally moments after an employer has published it to see what the gender pay gap is in each individual company. And this has really helped to make individual companies sit up and go wow we need to do something and we saw some very live examples of this particularly in the first year so for example um in the first year when uh, in 2018 when employers were uh, still quite new to this still trying to work out how to uh, calculate the data and how to publish it there were a number of employers that were followed by um various media outlets that actually ask the questions why why is your gender pay gap so big uh why does it say this in your gender? is this accurate and we saw some big changes to uh the information that employers supplied about their gender pay gap data because they realized that this was really interesting we also know from working with employers that their employees were a crucial audience to them too. And they didn't want to publish something that their employees, it made, made their employees feel uncomfortable and as if they had got a bad deal. And so we provided a lot of advice to employers on how to explain the data to their employees as well. And we have uh, explanations on our own website as, as, as to what the data means and, and what actions employers can take in order to tackle the gender pay gap. And this this is now turned into quite a business as usual process. Thankfully, after those very exciting first couple of years, we, we now have over 10,000 employers reporting each year. Uh, they have to re report by March and uh, for public companies and uh, April for private sector companies. And each year, uh, if they fail to report on time, uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission are, uh, will begin an investigation and uh, bring the, those companies to uh, publish their data as soon as possible. And Thankfully, over the course of, of the past uh, five years, we, we have actually seen a reduction in the gender pay gap in the UK, and uh, it has now reached an all time low of 15.4%, which uh, is fantastic. However, uh, it is still 15.4%, and, and there's still much more work that we need to do. So um, now that gender pay gap reporting has become uh, a, a normal part of business reporting. We're focusing on uh, what we can do to get employers to take action to close that gender pay gap. And we're also dealing with new exacerbated problems that have, have uh, really come to light in a post pandemic. So in the UK, we're struggling with skills shortages, we're struggling with talent attraction, and we're still struggling with staff retention. So we have record high levels of employment, but there are still shortages in technical roles. Um, and this is mismatched because we know that there's more women than ever coming out of school and university with higher qualifications than ever before. Yet we still have great shortages of women in different sectors like the, the STEM sectors. So we're trying to look at those uh, and, and trying to help those sectors to 
try and attract more women and also try to retain them in the uh, their workforces. So first of all, we are building the evidence base. Uh, our analysts are analyzing the current data around what does what does the workforce look like in a post covid uh, economy um, and we're also looking at what works to where where those gaps are and what works to, to plug those gaps so first of all we have a stem returners program and this came about because we recognized that in that period when women uh, drop out of the workforce uh, for caring responsibilities many women who work in stem roles often don't return to them. And that's for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's just because the work doesn't fit with the lifestyle around uh, caring and, and their new life as a parent. But also a lot is to do with the fact that very technical roles, the expertise moves on. And in just the space of a year, two years, a woman's skill set can become out of date. And so what we're doing is we're working with uh, employers in the STEM sector, plus women who have been working in STEM roles, but have been out of them for more than a year to try and work out what are the barriers that stop a woman from going back into those uh, roles and making a successful career after having children or taking time out of the workforce for whatever reason, uh, it, it, that's lasted for more than 12 months. So we'll, we will uh, draw together all of the evidence that we, and the learning that we get from that and create that, create from that a, a toolkit, which will help more employers to make sure that they don't lose that valuable resource of these experienced women who drop out for caring reasons. We're also setting up a high growth enterprise task force uh, for to try and increase the number of women who are setting up high growth enterprises. We know that a lot of uh, technical companies, a lot of uh, uh, financial companies are set up by men. We know that women only have access to around 1% of the venture capitalist funding in the UK. So we have created an amazing task force of really impressive uh, entrepreneurs from the UK who are working out why it is there are so few of them and trying to work out how to give women who would like to set up a high growth business a an instruction manual on how to do that. But also, how do we unlock that venture capital funding to make sure that women get a better share of that pot as well? Uh, we estimate that if women set up high growth businesses on the, at the same level as men, that it could add an extra 250 billion pounds to the economy. So this really makes sense. Uh, and so we are uh, really keen to, to push that on and uh, we are looking to produce our findings and our outputs later in 2023. So we will look forward to sharing that with you uh, in coming uh, months. But then returning to the theme of pay transparency, we're also taking the next steps in pay transparency and developing a pay transparency pilot. So we're working with businesses to try and encourage more employers to include pay scales in job advertisements and stop them asking about pay history. Currently in the UK, a lot of employers will just provide a, a job advert that says this job includes this, 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 we're looking for this, 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 and they don't include the amount of pay that somebody can expect to receive. And we know from, ex from our research that women and people from minority ethnic backgrounds are disadvantaged by this they are much less likely to negotiate a competitive pay package if they don't know what the parameters are within which they can negotiate. So we are calling for employers to add pay scales to job adverts, but we know that this isn't straightforward in many cases. So we're partnering with, we have a business working group and we have a, uh, an analytical uh, and behavioral science team to support us that are working out why it is that employers don't include pay scales in job adverts now and working out how to help them do that. So we're creating a methodology to make sure that employers provide accurate pay data 
and also making sure that they don't inadvertently set out or appear to set out a, a equal pay issue whilst they're publishing their pay data. So we're looking at it in a holistic way to try and get employers to take a much more methodical approach to how they calculate pay based on what their the role contributes to their company and also the value of the employees or potential employees uh, experience and skills to that role to then calculate what their final pay package will be. We also know that a lot of uh, employers at the moment calculate pay based on what somebody has earned previously. And again, we know that women are disadvantaged by this. So when a woman starts in a new role, if she's asked, what do you uh, get? What were you paid in your previous role? A woman often answers truthfully and a man maybe less so. Uh, so, what, uh, so we know from that that uh, a company already um, is, is going to be basing what its uh, pay calculation is on uh, unsatisfactory uh, information. Plus, we know, as we saw from the graph earlier, a woman is more likely to have earned less as she goes through her career as well. So a woman is automatically disadvantaged when she comes to pay negotiations. If Even if both a man and a woman are entirely truthful about what they uh, earned previously, because a woman's more likely to earn less previously. So in giving employers the tools to make a more methodical calculation for their uh, pay, we're also asking them to stop asking questions about pay history. And our aim is to sell this as, as something that actually makes business sense. It's not just a good thing for helping uh, women. It's, it's, it's a good way for employers to understand what they pay their employees and why, and be more methodical all the way through that. But we know that we can't just say that that's a good thing to do. So part of our project is to continue to build the evidence base for UK employers to help them understand why this makes good business sense. And once we've got all of this package of tools for employers, employees and, and all of that, we're going to be sh sharing best practice and uh, we will be uh, making the most of our early adopters. We know there are a lot of companies that are interested in doing this early. Uh, and so we, we will be showing those off, but also encouraging them to help their business uh, colleagues to to help other companies to uh, learn from their best practice because we know there's only so much that government can can lead the way in this and it has to be an organic business-led discussion to make this really work for business and again you are our first audience too we would love to share what we learn uh, when we've, uh, we've got those materials to hand sometime over the course of next year too. So finally, as I uh, said, uh, there's lots of information uh, around uh, what we're doing on uh, the website. I've also shared my contact details if you'd like to get in touch with me and our, uh, our uh, Twitter and Instagram handle there as well. So you can see the latest news from the Government Equalities Office and the wider Equality Hub because uh, we've got new ministers and we'll be doing lots of exciting new things uh, as we go forward. So please do get in touch if you'd like any further information. And thank you very much for listening to uh, what we've done so far on my presentation. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Gillian. Your story was actually very exciting, but we have one question. Thank you. Thank you for such a wonderful story about the UK experience. I have a practical question. I know that you, uh, that your employers need to uh, supply their data on eight indicators. So how did you devise these eight indicators? Thank you. With a lot of research. <laughs> so first of all, we spoke to uh, statisticians to work out which were the best indicators to demonstrate the clearest differences in most organizations. But then we also looked to businesses to find out what data was readily available to them. So we spoke to employers uh, to, to understand what information they had on payroll data, but also payroll 
service providers to work out how easy it was to extract that data and by using all of that uh, we created these quite small measures but quite powerful measures um, and but we, we recognize that even those uh, can be quite complicated for employers so we've created a lot of uh, guidance as well on how to make the calculations. So uh, if you look at the, the gender pay gap reporting website, there is uh, guidance on how to calculate the mean and median, for instance, which a lot of people don't remember the difference from high school maths. So uh, there's, there's a, uh, a, a, some very basic advice on how to make those calculations but we know that they aren't a perfect measure they're a one size fits all measure uh, and what was critical to us was making sure that the majority of employers could make those calculations and that they would be a representative a, a, a pretty representative uh, number but what we also encourage is for employers to look beneath those calculations to do their own uh, analysis internally to find out what those the, what that data is actually saying to them too. I wonder if uh, uh, you are also working and somehow reflecting on the British enterprises and companies that are actually working abroad. We do to a certain extent, and it, it's it's really interesting actually um, how the multinational companies uh, have managed the message um, both in the UK and overseas. So we don't require employers to report on their employees outside of the UK, but we know that this has had a knock-on effect across the world because, uh, of course, employees of a company, for instance, Shell, uh, I know that uh, the uh, Shell company uh, created a, a video for their entire international workforce to explain what their UK gender pay gap data meant because they they knew that the news would travel across borders and the information is available to everybody via our website immediately so they managed that ex that across their workforce and in fact created gender pay gap data across their workforce there's also um, a lot of uh, employers with uh, business interests in um, countries such as Canada, as, as we're about to hear from, that recognised that this was coming down the line in Canada or, for instance, in Australia, who whose gender pay gap reporting predated our regime by five years. In Australia, a lot of companies were already reporting gender pay gap data. So it's interesting how those international companies uh, approached it with their different uh, nationality workforces. Uh, and and I, I think it ha we, we don't have a measure, but I think it has had a knock on effect uh, into other countries, even where there is no requirement to do gender pay gap reporting, because it's just made it more visible. And their company's name is, is, is on a website in the UK with a measure of, of how much they pay men and women. And uh, that just piques people's interest. Thank you very much. Your story was very exciting and thank you for joining and uh, we we'll heard uh, the situation and the experience of the UK and I remind you that you have an opportunity to contact Gillian and uh, to ask for more information.